All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 345, and we're going to kick off this exciting session on genomics and dermatology. Uh, so that way we can uh, keep uh, on time this evening. I know everyone probably has wonderful evening plans. I think this session is an, an incredibly unique one. I don't think you're going to find it at many meetings, but it's here at South Beach Symposium. We have a wonderful lineup, and we're going to really dig deep into how to to bring cutting edge technologies that are being developed into the, into the clinic to help our patients. I'm gonna kick things off over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, really giving a, a background into what precision medicine is. Uh, here are my disclosures, none of which are relevant for uh, this talk. So what is precision medicine? Let's look at three definitions. The Oxford Dictionary says that precision medicine is medical care that's designed to optimize efficiency or therapeutic benefit for a particular group of patients by paying attention to genetic or molecular profiling. The National Cancer Institute goes a step further and actually says that precision medicine is synonymous with personalized medicine. We hear those terms thrown out all the time in medicine now, but they're sort of synonymous. So the National Cancer Institute says that precision medicine uses information from a person's own genes or proteins to help prevent, diagnose, or treat disease. And they use an example from cancer, right, where you can take information about a person's tumor and then use it to help diagnose, make a treatment plan, or whether a therapy is working. At the very bottom, the United States Food and Drug Administration also synonymously equates precision medicine and personalized medicine, but they make a very interesting statement and that is that most medical treatments are designed for the average patient as a one-size-fits-all approach. And we know in dermatology, whether you're on the aesthetic side, the medical side, or a blend of both, that one size does not fit all dermatology patients. So they go on to define precision medicine as innovative approaches that can uh, use a person's genes, environments, and lifestyles to ultimately bring the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. So there are actually many elements that go into precision medicine. So if we start on the, the lower left there, or the far left, population science, clinical discovery, basic molecular discoveries, all of that feeds into a wealth of knowledge, builds into computational health, digital health, imaging, the omics revolution, which we're gonna focus on, and this is all operated under the guise of ethics and engagement of our patients. On, as this flows towards the right, what we're ultimately doing is creating a knowledge network of genomics, microbiome, exposures, behaviors, clinical tests. And that knowledge network then feeds back in to create more innovation, but ultimately it's benefiting communities, patients, clinicians, researchers. Let's look deeper at how that happens. If there's one take home point from today, I want you to remember the term molecular endotype, okay? Precision medicine is driven by molecular endotype. We in dermatology know very well that many patients can come in and have a similar presentation. Their clinical phenotype is the same, but the disease itself may not be. And part of what the genomic revolution is bringing to dermatology is to be able to take these patients that all look the same morphologically or phenotypically and say, what are the molecular endotypes? What are the different molecular mechanisms driving this patient's particular phenotype? Because they're not all the same. And better treatment for patients depends on knowing these endotypes or subtypes. We see this in our psoriasis patients, our AD patients. We see it in things like hand eczema. So let's take a, a closer look at comparing standard and precision medicine. So on the left, standard medicine, we have our group of patients that have typically come in. They have a similar clinical phenotype, but they're not quite actually the same disease. Right now, the endotyping for standard medicine really involves clinical practice guidelines, randomized controlled trials, meta-analyses, and physician experience, which don't discount. Experience does matter. But ultimately, the standardized treatment means that a subgroup of patients with that disease or phenotype maybe 100% respond to that treatment, maybe another subgroup only 50%, and maybe a subgroup, none of them respond to that treatment. That's not the ultimate goal of the care that we want to provide 
in medicine as a whole and certainly in our specialty dermatology. So on the right, in precision medicine, you have the same heterogeneous group of patients that have a similar clinical phenotype, but now endotyping is advancing with science. We have genetics, the clinical data, we have the multi-omics integration, which I'll go into more detail on, and the exposome, all the environmental factors that come in and affect an organism. And now that's leading to information, so you have treatment one, treatment two, and treatment three, and each of those treatments goes to a specific subtype or endotype so that they all patients have 100% response. That's the goal of precision medicine. And here are the different omics. So really, we're in the era of omics revolution, not just creating the omics, th that's been created, but actually bringing the, translating the omics into the clinic, what I call the scientific bench to the bedside. We hear that a lot, but it's happening in our dermatology clinics. So here, the omics can be phenomics, which is all the traits of an organism that contribute to a specific phenotype, genomics, transcriptomics, exposomics, right, which is the environment, environmental things that contribute, metabolomics, proteomics, epigenomics, and microbiomics. So what I've said to this point is that certain precision medicine can be figuring out a better treatment for subtypes of patients. But precision medicine can also mean another thing, and that is you have one subtype of patients or one clinical disease, and you continue to improve the precision of the medicine for that one particular group. And so an example uh, here is from oncology, where on, on the, the left column you can see cancer therapy type, on the right column different examples of drugs. So you start at chemotherapy, hormone therapy, epigenetic modifiers, on down to therapeutic antibodies and cell signaling inhibitors, so you can also have precision medicine where one disease, you have increasing precision over time. So how is this happening or being incorporated into dermatology? This is an example from Nature Medicine of 2020. A patient with DRESS syndrome, a well-known drug hypersensitivity reaction that we hope not to see in dermatology, uh, a patient had dress and was not responding to the common clinical therapies. And this group decided to go to the next step. They took a skin sample, separated out individual cells, used the 10X genomics platform to then do basically single cell level sequencing. They then took uh, from the gene expression uh, analysis uh, the data and found that a specific uh, pathway, the jack stat pathway, was elevated in this particular patient's T cells. And so this led them, this was a molecular data-driven change in therapy for this patient with DRESS syndrome, where tofacitinib was now used and the patient responded. So what other technologies are being used to, to advance precision medicine and dermatology? One of the technologies I want you to be aware of is next generation sequencing of dermally extracted RNA. So mind.px here, they have a booth right next door. You may have seen it while you're eating that wonderful ice cream. So the mind.px is from Mindera Health. And what they do is they have a dermal patch that goes on the stratum corneum, and it isolates around 7,000 different pieces of RNA or biomarkers. And their data analysis is able to take those 7,000 pieces of RNA and, and evaluate them and now take psoriasis patients and stratify them into potential responders to, to anti-TNF agents, to IL-23 inhibitors, or IL-17 inhibitors, which is a step forward in our basic care of our patients, where we now can maybe get them on a biologic or a therapy that's going to be successful from the beginning, rather than having them have to change therapies very frequently. There's another technique that I would like to bring to your attention. It's cytokine RNA in situ hybridization. Now this technique has been largely utilized and pioneered by Bill Damsky, who you're going to hear from in a few talks, okay? So routine skin biopsy can be obtained from patients. You can use uh, hybridizing probes to the messenger RNA and then amplify, detect signal, and ultimately get a profile, as shown on the right, uh, an individualized profile of potential druggable cytokines. So in this particular example, the IL-13 is high, so maybe you treat with trilokinumab, maybe you treat with lebrakizumab when it becomes available. 
In addition, this RNA and cyto hybridization, when principal component analysis is applied to data from two different diseases, in this case, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, well, what the PCA analysis shows is that the signals from the RNA and cyto hybridization, in fact, do cluster separately. So you can use this data to really distinguish uh, diagnosis and disease. So let's go to melanoma. For those of you that were here yesterday, we actually talked a lot about melanoma and detection. So on the slide on the left, I, I, there's a lot of signaling. This is the signaling pathway uh, behind melanoma. And I certainly don't expect you to read all of these little uh, cytokines and, and uh, kinases that are involved here. The point is, in these orange boxes, are multiple different categories of drugs all being developed to target specific pathways. This is advancing precision medicine to try to target specific cell signaling pathways. That's one approach of precision medicine in melanoma. On the right, what you're seeing is uh, different single cell approaches that are being used to understand cancer, in particular tumor diversity, heterogeneity, uh, tracking individual uh, evolution of cancers, the tumor microenvironment, and drug resistance mechanisms. So those are all things that are being looked at at the single cell level. Uh, yesterday, we talked a lot about the Decision DX uh, melanoma uh, 31 gene expression profile test and how it's effective in stratifying melanoma patients into low, medium, or high risk for recurrence and or metastasis within five years. And I think some of the data that came out uh, or was shared yesterday was that the three-year data, it's the only test that actually shows a 27% reduction in death by melanoma. So it's, there's definitely real-world evidence of genomics being applied to melanoma in dermatology to save or help patients. So I'd like to end with this, especially for those investors out there. Uh, global precision medicine market is expected to grow fourfold over the next decade. In 2019, it was about a $200 billion market. In 2030, it's going to be about a $740 billion market, representing a 12.1% market growth rate. Sounds good right now in today's environment. On the right, it's just a kind of a kind of wheel pattern here summary of what precision, precision medicine really means for patients. You can have biomarker discovery to help prognosis. You can have pharmacogenomic markers to improve response to treatment. You can have profile-based patient clustering to improve stratification and endotyping of disease. You can have discovery of old drugs for new purposes, known as drug repurposing. You can continue to discover new molecular profiles to aid in diagnosis. You can uh, also continue to find new pathways, new targets, and that's certainly obviously research that's very important to the growth of dermatology. So with that, uh, I hope that you have a good definition of precision medicine, and I'd like to introduce uh, Aaron Farber to come up and continue our session on new innovations uh, across the spectrum. Thank you. All right, let's keep this going. Um, and uh, gosh, you know, I know that we discussed uh, GEPs yesterday, and we're doing a bunch today. And even though we had a, a pre-meeting, we're going to cross over on each other on a couple of the items. And so don't worry. I've got lots of slides. I'm going to click through the ones that are repeats um, from what Chris has covered. So don't think it's going to be any of the same stuff here. We're talking about new innovations across the spectrum. Um, I'm Aaron Farberg, again, private practice uh, down in Dallas, uh, Texas. Um, my background, for those who don't know, I did plastic surgery first and med school at Michigan, and then from there did a fellowship with Daryl Regal, uh, the inventor of the ABCDs of melanoma in New York, followed by dermatology at Sinai, and then went down to Arkansas for Mohs, and then ended up in Dallas. In any case, uh, I am an advisor for Castle Biosciences. We'll be talking about some of their items today. Genomics, it's a little bit different from genetics. I know sometimes we kind of confuse those terms. Genetics, think back to biology with genes and her, uh, hereditary diseases. That's really your genetics. The genomics is actually those gene functions. And what's kind of cool is that we're still learning so many of those gene functions. Uh, when you think about the uh, Decision DX melanoma test, the 31 GEP that was mentioned, <clears throat> some of the critics years ago said, well, gosh, these genes don't even have anything to do with melanoma. Well, 
10 years later, 15 years later, actually they do. So we're, we're, this field is still very new, as Chris was saying, um, and uh, the future is very, very bright. Here's all the things that I can cover. I'm just gonna blitz through and give you top line, what's new, what's different, what's important, what really would matter to you as a clinician and what you can change tomorrow. First, melanoma diagnosis. Diagnosing melanoma. And uh, so what am I talking about here? Well, there's a couple of million biopsies that go on every year. And once in a while, and it's actually not a small while, about 300,000 of these are very difficult to diagnose. These are challenging lesions that even the best dermatopathologists will look at and say, hmm, I'm not totally sure. Then they'll call up a friend or they'll call up a group of friends and have a big meeting on it and they'll get some ancillary testing. These are the difficult lesions and they do actually happen quite a bit. You can actually consider gene expression profiling as an ancillary test besides asking your friend or besides um, uh, using something like fish, for example. Now, I'm sure some of you are starting to fall asleep thinking, well, gosh, this is for a dermatopathologist. I'm not into dermatopathology. Where's all the pink and blue? Wait a second. You're the one that's actually seeing the patient, right? You're the one that's actually cutting something out or leaving it be. So you can actually ask for ancillary testing. And it's not to over jump over your dermatopathologist. It's actually to improve your discussion with them, right? And so I just want to target for you and remind you of what lesions am I talking about, where you as a dermatologist might actually go to your dermatopathologist and say, hey, I'd like some more information. Think about if you have an uncertain diagnosis, like an AIMP. What even is an AIMP? I mean, thankfully, Clay Cockrell is my derm path. I don't get that because I need to know what to do with this anyways. But think about a dysplastic nevus, right? What do you do with your dysplastic nevi? Some of us treat all of these lesions like it's the absolute worst that it could be, like it's a melanoma, but do we really have to treat those patients in that way? Or you get something that says a melanoma, or you cannot exclude a melanoma in situ. Great, well that means I'm just gonna call it a melanoma in situ and treat it as such. Um, what about when you get a report that says it's benign, but oh, please, cut the rest of it out? Why? It's benign, so that kind of conflicts. Or what about if you know, you're biopsying this lesion because you actually think it's a melanoma. You're really concerned. Their mother has had melanoma. They've had three other melanomas. You thought this was a melanoma, and it comes back as something totally benign. Well, the onus is still on you to think, well, maybe I need to get extra testing or a second evaluation. Lots of reasons why you might consider this. Or, for example, if it's a lesion on a cosmetically sensitive area. Think about your dysplastic nevus that's on the shin. Do you really have to do the five millimeter margin or do you think you could maybe do a narrow? Think about testing. Um, that's where this comes in. You've got the, uh, it's, it's, there's two tests, all right? It's both under one company, that is Castle. It originally was a 35 gene that they had and then they also bought this other test called MyPath that we're all familiar with um, and that's the 23 gene. What they've done, what's new, what you need to know, is that they actually run both tests in tandem. They don't do both tests unless they have to, but they'll first run the 23 GEP, get you a result. The problem with that test is that about 10% of the time, you get an intermediate result. That's annoying, because I still need to know what to do with it. So then they run the more specific test, the 35 GEP, to really give you that actionable result. On to cutaneous melanoma prognosis, all right? We're going quick. This is stuff you've already seen. Again, you wanna figure out who you're gonna send for a sentinel node, what's their risk of recurrence, or what's their risk of dying, because that changes your management. Uh, again, NCCN wants to individualize your care. There's two different tests out there. Uh, the 31 GEP, the Decision DX melanoma, that is commercially available. The 8 GEP plus clinical pathologic features because it was developed together. It's an assay, um, uh, it's called the Merlin assay. This was uh, developed in tandem with the Mayo Clinic. I call it an assay because it's really experimental and it's mostly being used by those few large institutions that are heavily invested in it. You've already seen this slide, you wanna get more precise, you're using clinical pathologic features, this is the type of information you now get on your patient. Your actual patient's risk of not just living and dying, the melanoma specific survival, but whether or not they're gonna have a distant metastasis or they're gonna have a recurrence. Those numbers matter. AJCC doesn't provide those numbers, but I tell you, if you have a recurrence of your melanoma, 
it's great to know whether you're going to live or die and probably going to live, but it's also good to know if I'm going to have a recurrence. That's a bad month if you have a recurrence, by the way. Sentinel lymph node biopsy, you get actually precise numbers. Now, I've already showed you this slide from before. Don't just trust me as to what I think about this test. Uh, Dr. Marchetti had also evaluated this. He did a clinical utility study, showed that there was actual utility, um, which is uh, also very important here. More data. This was the collaboration that the National Cancer Institute was involved with, uh, looking at the SEER database. This, again, we're not a socialized healthcare system uh, like many of the European countries, but this is as good as we're going to get. And this is our government at its best. And so what they did is they looked at patients that actually got the 31 GEP test, and then they also compared it to patients that did not get the test. And they wanted to see, A, does the test actually work? Does it stratify? This is a prospective, unselected cohort. There's nothing fancy here. This was the best data you could ever get from our own government. Um, and then they looked at from 2016 and beyond because they wanted to make sure that, hey, new adjuvant therapies were coming out, making sure everybody was going to be treated the same. They compared it to a group that also uh, was otherwise, you know, three to one matched in every way possible and wanted to compare it. Does the test actually help people live? First of all, yes, you can see it stratifies the patients. And then again, this was the data that Chris had mentioned earlier. Yes, you're, you actually have solid data to show that your patients are going to live longer when you have this information. So you're now combining all those, that chain of evidence when you have a test, no, it doesn't help your patient live longer, but you're then able to think about it and make management decisions that actually will help your patient live longer. Here's the squamous cell test. You've heard about this one, the 40 GEP. What's new? There's a new validation cohort. Some of the most boring slides are seeing Kaplan-Meier curve after Kaplan-Meier curve. I call them now castle curves because they're just always up now whenever the company's presenting. Uh, but you need this. This is what proves that this is actually working. And so now there's over 1,000 patients that have been studied. You've seen how people have been using this over the last year. Um, and the answer is you've been using it correctly. All right, a little more exciting here, inflammatory disease. So which one of these is psoriasis and which one of these is atopic dermatitis? It's kind of tough, right? Well, you know, I was trained by these two world experts. We have Emma Gutman, atopic dermatitis, and uh, of course, Mark Lebel, a guy I said invented psoriasis. Um, it's easy for them. They could probably figure out which one is which, but you know, for me, the lonely, you know, community dermatologist, it's, it can be a little bit harder. And so what's really cool is DermTech, you know, they've got their, um, they've got their sticker and they do cool stuff when it comes to identifying uh, melanoma and dangerous lesions there, but it's also the technology that's really cool. So they, they uh, presented this study showing, hey, we can tell the difference between atopic dermatitis and psoriasis by looking at these genes, and they found, usually utilizing just a couple of them, that they can help answer that question. Very cool. Uh, Dr. Gutman's lab had also done something similar with their own various uh, uh, tape technology, and uh, utilizing just NOS2, they're able to determine what is psoriasis, what is atopic dermatitis. Um, but what do you do with that? What really matters is, what am I going to treat them with? Which biologic, which JAK inhibitor, which, what am I going to use to actually treat these patients? So can we use precision medicine to optimize that? You've already heard about MindPX. They do have a booth out there. Go check them out. It's, uh, it's this awesome little uh, microneedling patch that can then tell you how they hid the MindPX on mine. Huh, they are tough on my slides. Um, Anyways, so it's it's uh, so you can essentially guide your patients as to which their cl which class of drugs they're most likely to respond to, and I'll just remind you: even if you increase it by like one percent, that has a huge impact. And it, this is your patient. This is your mom. This is your dad. You want to get them the right treatment earlier on. If you were going into Las Vegas, you want the best odds at anything you're doing. This only increases your odds at getting it right. Um, they have good accuracy metrics, you know, still missing on some of the studies, need to get more and more data, and I know the company is hard at work trying to do that. It's also cool as I'm collaborating with another group, Castle, and doing something similar, but also with atopic dermatitis, um, as well as some other diseases, and instead of using a microneedling patch, what do we do all day when we see fungus? We scrape, right? You've all used a curette, so now you can curette 
get the same genomic material and then uh, and develop algorithms to help guide uh, treatment management with that. Here was a poster that I presented uh, uh, not too long ago with um, uh, Dr. Silverberg showing that you can actually see genes with those scrapings. And I'm a minute over time. Thank you again. Looking forward to the question and answer. I was in a conference, thank you, Aaron. I was in a conference call several months ago, and I heard for the first time that genomics was being applied to cosmetics, aesthetics patients. I didn't know that. But we're going to have the world expert on it right now, Joe Weibel. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chris. That was a, a very nice intro. It's, welcome to Miami. I'm Jill Weibel. I'm here in uh, Miami, and um, we are doing a lot of uh, cosmetic genomics. So these are my disclosures. I do as many clinical trials as regular patients that I see, and I'm really a scientist in a dermatologist body. But so um, I'm really interested in regenerative medicine, and I think it could be the ultimate scientific secret. And there are so many diseases that we can heal once we get uh, through all the red tape. Um, and once we do, it is undeniable that regenerative-based therapies will improve human health. And we are at the cusp of revolutionizing healthcare by establishing regenerative medicine. And now one problem we have is that we are a little off the rails in aesthetic medicine. Um, the FDA is now on the offensive, and they really should be. I am part of a group that's the Aesthetic Stem Cell Society. I'm a founding member, and we go and see Dr. Peter Marks, who's head of the Sieber Division of FDA. And just, uh, this is a report we did at his request, which you never like to be requested by the FDA, but these are stem cells and other treatments that um, were done without the FDA approval, many of them here in South Florida, uh, that led to blindness, uh, glioneuromal neoplasms, um, uh, loss of, of, of genitals, and other things. So this is why the FDA is not approving uh, therapies that could help patients is because people are doing them inappropriately, and we have to really move forward with them. Um, stem cells are one of my passions, and currently there is only one stem cell product that the FDA has approved, and that's for bone marrow transplants. If that is not happening, then it is not approved. And the FDA is currently going after physicians and taking away licenses if they find you're using them. And again, it's, it's holding back many patients from getting good therapies. Um, exosomes, and I know there's exosome people here. Um, we're still learning about exosomes. I believe in them, but they do carry DNA and RNA. And again, unfortunately, the FDA has issued warnings. And I think it is important as physicians and, ex and extenders and medical people that if the FDA tells you, um, they currently believe there are no FDA approved exosome products. And they're, they're, the companies are all working on that. And there are going to be approvals soon. They even have a hotline if someone was hurt using them. And again, you've never seen the FDA doing things like this before. So I think it's important we move on. So anyway, I think aesthetic medicine's a little bit in the Wild West right now with regenerative medicine. But I think we can responsibly move it forward. All right, now I'm going to show you a few of the trials that uh, we've been involved in, and I think it's exciting times. So one trial that we have finished, I do not have the final data, is we did a trial with um, PLLA, polylactic acid, on the nasolabial folds and we, versus calcium hydroxyapatite, uh, both biostimulators. These are not uh, fillers, these stimulate your immune system, and we did baseline biopsies in 30 day, and we are getting 200 uh, different uh, gene markers on these. I got the first set of data this afternoon, but we're going to be able to look and see what genes are affected and better understand the mechanism of action. I'm super excited about this, and I should be able to report it um, hopefully in the next two to three months. Uh, second study that we're starting on Monday is, this is microcoring. It's a new I think it's the most exciting thing going on. Uh, Rox Anderson invented it at Harvard. It takes out little cores of tissue and closes. It was FDA approved actually for wrinkles. I did the, all the clinical trials. Um, but it's great for laxity. And we'll be sending these cores in starting Monday for genetic analysis to really look at the mechanism of action of how it changes the skin. We also will be doing 3D vector imaging at the same time so we can really learn about these therapies we're using in clinic and not just doing them without scientific evidence. I think that's actually the biggest 
biggest problem in aesthetic medicine right now. I'm old, and so when I came, when I started, everything really had a lot of science, and now there's so many devices out there that don't work, and patients get frustrated, and then it hurts us all. Um, human IND trials uh, that I'm involved with, well this one, this is just, this is, I'm not involved with this, but I think this is fascinating in the regenerative uh, space. This came out of New York. Um, they had a, and there's a lot of ethical concerns here, and so, but uh, surgeons at NYU put a, a, a pig kidney into a, a brain dead uh, patient, and it worked. Uh, so we're looking for organs in different places. So this is an animal to human transplant. Uh, the patient w was dying, but it was interesting that it worked. Uh, another good friend of mine, Tony Atella at Wake Forest, has uh, grown uh, stem cell bladders in his lab and put them into humans, and it worked. So we already are inputting uh, organs into humans. Um, I'm going to talk about three studies that we're working on. Uh, and again, you know, stem cells not yet there. Um, lots of debate on, especially embryonic stem cells. Although we've 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 leaped forward, and we. And I, although we don't want loose regulation, because as I showed you, patients get hurt. If we have too much regulation, we could stifle the ability to save lives. And the entire regenerative medicine field, which is sort of where I feel like we are right now in Japan, is killing us. Uh, they're so far ahead. And it's really, I believe, the first time the United States isn't leading in the field of medicine. So Dr. Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize in 2012, and what he was able to do was culture stem cells with virus vectors so that we have pluripotent stem cells that we can culture, uh, usually from a young male, um, healthy stem cell line. And there's different types of stem cells, embryonic bone marrow, umbilical, adipose, and epidermal. I've used them all in lab settings. I currently am involved in two human IND trials, that means investigational new drugs, uh, for um, umbilical cord. That's uh, what I believe are going to be the best. Uh, they're no longer controversial because of the sourcing and the culturing. Um, one of the things that we do at University of Miami, right across the the bay is, um, I do a lot of burn and trauma patients. I, I like to work on their scars. And one day I'm like, why don't we just grow new skin? Uh, so uh, I did a, a series of experiments with uh, Professor Badiavis and Professor Davis using laser-assisted delivery of stem cells into uh, pigs. <laughs> and it's not glamorous, but it's true. And uh, there's our team in the basement uh, of Miami. So we have a hypertrophic burn scar model in these pigs. We unfortunately burn the pigs and we do everything under eye cook and very humane. And then we use the laser and we topically applied uh, stem cells from another pig. And um, I'll, I'll, I don't have a ton of time, but basically what we found is they regrew skin on an acute third degree burn model. But not only that, we saw that the stem cells were traveling through the pig to the control side of the pig. and. Um, we that was not expected. Also, we thought the FDA is not going to like this. So we did a second study where we took uh, mice that had leukemia. They were skid mice, and we gave them a lethal dose of radiation, and um, that means they're going to die. And we put half of them, we gave one laser pulse and topically applied stem cells from this little guy. We took out his bone marrow and topically applied stem cells, and every mouse that got this lived, and every mouse that didn't died. So we basically cured leukemia with one laser pulse and topically applying stem cells. And we proved this and published this, that we basically did a bone marrow transplant through one laser, and um, we could show that their uh, FDA or their RNA and DNA chimerized into the new mouse. So uh, now I'm starting five IND trials at the Miami Cancer Institute uh, with Gunther Kona. Uh, the last project I'm going to talk about is uh, ERA, an epigenetic reprogramming of aging. This credit all goes to Dr. Sebastiano, uh, who's out of Stanford, and um, he is a uh, PhD scientist who studies um, embryology. And what he has noticed is that from the time you're a baby, as you age, bad things happen to our epigenetic program, including methylation of your DNA, histone proteins, bad organization of our DNA. And so because our epigenetic code drifts in the wrong direction, we become dysfunctional, starting at the age of 20, by the way. It's all downhill. So <laughs> I know it's not good. So his thought was, well, if when we're in utero, we go this way, and become humans, why can't we reverse the order? It's brilliant thinking. So he has come up with an mRNA 
technology, and um, I'm going to be working on the dermatology and definitely in the anti-aging spectrum of this. We had a webinar, and the mRNA is great because it never enters the cell nucleus or the DNA, so a lot of the problems we have with safety of stem cells are going to be um, circumvented with this, and um, there's a lot of proprietary information, but this is a very simple and very and it works every time in vitro. It has not been tried in vivo yet, so we're, we'll be looking forward to that. So in dermatology, in the, the lab, what we've already seen um, by, turn, by putting this mRNA on cells is that we are able to take aging skin and go to young skin. And what was really fascinating is the older the skin, the more it reversed in aging. So that was kind of cool So for those of us that are older. Um, and... and um, we're still trying to crunch all this data, but this is uh, the mRNA on uh, skin cells, and you could see that we saw the uh, superoxide dismutase, um, was the one on the left is untreated, and the arrows on the right was decreased. MMP1, which is a metal metallic proteinase, which breaks down our collagen, significantly decreased. And then things like P16, which cause, you know, can lead to both uh, squamous cell and melanoma. So all of our markers are looking good, and there's a lot of decrease in essence. So stay tuned for that. And then the only exosome that, I, that I, I'll mention here, you know, exosomes we're going to hear a lot about. Um, they, you know, your body contains thousands of these. They've been around for a long time. Um, I'm working a little bit with the one out of Mayo, which is a plant exosome, a platelet-derived regenerosome. And that's the thing we have to understand. When we hear the word exosome, there's so many different types. I think they're going to be here to stay, but we have to be safe. So it's a regenerative medicine world out there. I think if we can overcome the, the barriers limiting clinical translation that we're going to help a lot of people, and regulatory rule following is vital, and I um, would recommend that we all do this together. So thank you for having me this afternoon. Thank you, Jill. This is, the, I believe, the 21st year of South Beach Symposium. I think 20 years from now, an entire day will just be about regenerative medicine, and uh, hopefully I'll be younger, too. I'd like to introduce uh, Ayman Grata, who's going to talk about uh, applying regenerative medicine and wound heal and uh, genomics to wound healing. Thanks, Chris. How are we doing with time? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you still have some energy for me. Uh, it's really hard to talk after like very smart people. So uh, we'll start today. Um, we're going to talk about. Um, regenerative medicine and genomics techniques in wound healing. My name is Ayman Grada. I'm an adjunct professor of dermatology at Case Western Reserve. Um, I'm also a, uh, a medical director of dermatology at AbV. However, I have no relevant conflict of interest. This talk represents my own um, experience and doesn't does not represent AbV or its products. So we're going to talk today about biomarkers for chronic wounds. Let's start with the definition, with the basics. What is a, bi a biomarker? We hear a lot about biomarkers. So the Institute of Medicine now is also called the National Academy of Medicine, defines biomarkers as biological markers. Or biomarkers are char characteristic, characteristics that can be objectively measured and used as an indicator for normal biologic processes uh, disease processes or pharmacologic response to a therapy. Examples of biomarkers. Heart rate. Heart rate is a biomarker for heart failure. C-reactive protein, procalcitonin for inflammation. Blood sugar levels for diabetes. Um, or blood pressure for hypertension. Uh, what are sources of biomarkers? When we think about molecular biomarkers, you have saliva, blood, urine, CSF, hair, feces. Uh, but uh, biomarkers are not always molecules. You know, they can be something else, like symptom. Small, for example, smell dysfunction uh, as a biomarker of COVID-19. It has been studied using the University of Pennsylvania smell identification test. It's a validated. Uh, tool to test uh, the ability to smell. So this is not a molecule, and it is a biomarker. So why do we need biomarkers? Uh, in the clinical setting, 
you want to predict the response of the treatment uh, before you transition into a more aggressive treatment. So having a biomarker is going to help us predict the treatment response, especially in wound healing, because wounds, chronic wounds, they don't, they don't heal overnight. They, they take time. So uh, having a biomarker is, is a good thing. There are types of biomarkers. There's diagnostic biomarkers, risk biomarkers, prognostic biomarkers. There are predictive biomarkers like we talked about, uh, response biomarkers, you know, and safety biomarkers. Uh, so what's the difference between biomarkers and surrogate endpoints? We hear about surrogate endpoints in clinical trials. So there are clinical endpoints and there are surrogate endpoints. Surrogate end endpoints are defined as biomarkers that are intended to substitute for clinical endpoints, meaning they reflect how the patient feel and function. Uh, so there are biomarkers and, um, you know, for example, in diabetes, diabetes uh, clinical trials, uh, hemoglobin A1C is used as a surrogate biomarker at basis, uh, its, its basis of approval in FDA clinical trials. So this is an example of a surrogate biomarker. So let's switch to um, wounds here. So I like this study. So what we know that clinical cultures and wounds have little predictive value of outcomes. So what are we going to do? Um, Elizabeth Price, uh, Grice, sorry, uh, at UPenn, um, they conduct, her and her team conducted a study um, on a 100 patient with diabetic foot ulcer. And uh, she examined the microbiome of the chronic wound, the microenvironment. And what she found, her team as well, that the microbiota community instability was associated with faster healing and improved outcomes. That's interesting, right? You know, if someone reads this, they're like, wait a minute. You're telling me if I destabilize your microbiome, you're going to have better healing? We hear that that's not <laughs> we, we hear that you have to maintain the microbiome. You don't want to, like, disrupt the, my, the microbiome. But here we're talking about uh, uh, the stability versus the stability. We're not talking about diversity or abundance, relative abundance. So uh, the term instability, maybe it's the wrong term because it has some negative connotation, but what we mean about instability is the, the dynamic interactions between communities. So the microbial communities and in, in, in patients with uh, diabetic foot ulcers, uh, they exist in four distinct communities. And what they found in this study that the more, uh, you know, uh, transitions between the community when microbes, they visit communities, they visit each other, like visiting one city and you know, next day you visit another city, uh, uh, this is good for the, for the wound outcomes. But what's even more interesting, they found that patients with DFU who received a short course of systemic antibiotics for a reason like UTI or respiratory tract infection actually had uh, very good outcomes and uh, higher instability, significant instability in their microbial community with little or no impact on overall diversity and abundance. So this is, this is for me, it raises another question because we're talking about narrow versus broad spectrum antibiotics and we know that broad spectrum antibiotics can, can cause dysbiosis in the gut. Uh, but now here we're showing that a short course of systemic antibiotics actually associated with better healing outcomes. So we don't know whether the, the, the antibiotics that were used are narrow spectrum, broad spectrum, this is another question, but it's very interesting. The bottom line that a dynamic wound microbiome is indicative of clinical outcomes and may be a valuable guide for personalized management and the treatment of chronic wounds. So as you see here, this is a picture of PG, pyoderma gangrenosum. To date, we know that the pathogenic mechanism underlying PG remains incompletely understood. Um, a group in the Netherlands, uh, they did transcriptome analysis uh, for PG patients, and they found that there's an upregulation of the innate immunity. In this picture, you see how complex is the pathophysiology of PG. 
Uh, most importantly, there's high expression of IL-8 and IL-36. It's highly expressed in keratinocytes, and uh, it's associated with uh, neutrophil recruitment and also enhancing the IL-17, IL-23 access. There's a T-cell polarization, that's TH1, TH17 profile, and somehow it's like psoriasis. So uh, I'm going to transition here to a CMIC. CMIC is a proto-oncogen uh, that's uh, expressed in around 70% of cancers. Um, Mariana Tumikanik at the University of Miami found that the higher expression of CMIC and beta-catenin pathway is associated with poor healing outcomes, uh, you know, due to uh, decreased keratinocyte migration and alteration of the keratinocyte differentiation. And Therefore, a group in the Indiana University, they found this very interesting, and they started studying CMEC as a biomarker for diabetic foot ulcers. And the premise here is to use CMEC as, to evaluate CMEC as a prognostic biomarker. You know, it can be used at the initial visit to identify the likelihood of healing at week 12, and as a surrogate endpoint to uh, predict the complete wound healing by week 12. Um, talking about endpoints, the FDA clinical endpoints for wound clinical trials is complete wound closure. Uh, as you see, it's defined as, you know, a skin reepitalization re without drainage or dressing requirement confirmed at two consecutive study visits, two weeks apart. However, um, this, this study um, by Shandan at Indiana University found that, well, um, you know, chronic wounds that are uh, biofilm infected, infected, they can achieve uh, complete closure, but the problem, the barrier function is poor. So, unless you have a intact um, barrier function, uh, we, cannot, we cannot rely on complete closure as indication of complete healing. Actually, the study found that a repair that results in barrier function deficient skin favor wound recurrence. So that's why the, the, the concept of functional wound closure has emerged and, and the, the, the proposal is you know, to change the endpoint and in addition to complete closure, there need to be a confirm confirmation for restoration of the barrier function. And sorry, so for, for this reason, the, a transepidermal water loss is, gonna, is, is being studied as a potential biomarker for, uh, for chronic wounds uh, uh, because uh, barrier function is measured by transepidermal water loss. So there's ongoing study here, uh, you know, University of Miami included, of course. And uh, this page, uh, you know, you can find it in Google, Biomarker Consortium from NIH. There's a lot of information about biomarker. And therefore, I conclude my talk. Am I on time? All right. Good. All right. Uh, last but not least is uh, Bill Damsky, a, a colleague of mine from Yale University, and he's going to kind of talk about the bottom line, how to educate your patients about genomics. Well, thanks so much, Chris, for the invitation to, to speak today, um, and thank you, everyone, for your attention. Let me make sure I know how to go forward here. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, my name is Bill Damsky. I, I work at Yale with Dr. Bunick, and I'm happy to be speaking here today. Here are my disclosures, none of which are really relevant to the talk today. And while most of the speakers today have talked about genomics, I, I thought I might talk a little about uh, genetics in my examples. And it took a lot of restraint not to talk about um, our work in personalized medicine, atopic dermatitis, and psoriasis which I'd be happy to talk about afterwards. I'm going to talk to you a little about genetics and how it's in influenced dermatology. So take a look at this picture. See what you might think. This is a patient that has what's called disseminated superficial actinic porokeratosis. And the reason that I'm presenting this today is I think it's a really beautiful example of how basic genetic discovery in dermatology can influence uh, dermatologic care. So here's what most of us may imagine when we're thinking about a porokeratosis. 
Um, during dermatology residency, we're taught to recognize the so-called coronoid lamella, which is very distinctive and typical of this disorder. Well, Keith Choate, who is uh, our new chair at Yale, um, actually decided to look at the genetics of these uh, lesions. And interestingly, what he found was that there were mutations in a cholesterol metabolism pathway that's used by keratinocytes and plays an important role in their function. And not only did it find mutations in one component of this pathway, it found mutations in multiple components of this pathway. And really what Dr. Choate's lab did was um, look back at this pathway and think about, these were inactivating mutations, think about how, how potentially could this pathway have affected, uh, um, you know, biology in the skin. And really what they thought was that because we're disrupting um, uh, enzymes that, you know, progress this, this pathway, um, one problem is that there's a, a buildup of intermediate. So the enzymes that are required to make cholesterol in the skin are not functional, and so we have too many intermediates. The other potential problem is that we're actually lacking cholesterol, which is the end product of this pathway. And so I, I really love this story because it was a very simple solution, not a solution that required a you know, gigantic clinical trial, a solution that really just, in, just required some thinking. Uh, and so Dr. Choate's group reasoned that if potentially we use a drug that most of us are familiar with, all of us are familiar with, some of us may even be taking, um, our statin drugs, which are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, which inhibit a key uh, enzyme in this pathway, and cholesterol, which is the end product. And so can we potentially mitigate these two problems in these genetic lesions? Well, what Dr. Choate's group did, which is, is, is really just so cool, is they uh, compounded cholesterol they compounded it with lovastatin, and they applied it to the skin of patients with porokeratosis. Some of the patients had DSAP, disseminated porokeratosis, and photodamaged sites. Other patients had linear, blashko linear porokeratosis. And um, really remarkably, it works. And so this is just a tremendous example how genetic discovery uh, in dermatology really can influence the care of our patients. It's really just remarkable. Here's a couple other examples. Um, we're looking uh, on the right side of your slide here of an untreated versus treated area. And the result's not perfect, but it's, it's really quite impressive. And what they did through their studies is they determined that you can't just do one part or the other part. So you can't do just the statin, you can't do just the cholesterol. Really, they work synergistically together, really reinforcing the importance of the basic science. Here's another example of a patient treated with this. And um, Dr. Choate specializes in um, uh, blashko linear inflammatory dermatoses as well as other dermatoses. And these patients have very rare presentations of porokeratosis, but nonetheless, you can see the improvement they had really with this simple intervent intervention. A question that commonly comes up is whether, well, why don't we just have the patient take a statin by mouth? Um, seems like it'd be a lot more effective, particularly in patients with DSAP, for example. Well, statins actually undergo extensive first-pass metabolism in the liver, and so they have very limited systemic uh, bioavailability. So it's actually really important to apply them topically. And again, applying cholesterol with them is important as well. And so just to summarize the first half of the talk, um, and then I'll actually get into how we're going to edu educate our patients. I just love this as an example is when used appropriately, genomic investigation has the power to unlock fundamental concepts in disease pathology and identify new treatments. Porokeratoses have somatic mutations in cholesterol metabolism genes. Inhibiting metabolite buildup with a statin and supplying the end product cholesterol can be therapeutic, and I've showed you some examples of that. Topical, not systemic administration of the statin is key. Um, an investigation of genetic changes in individual patients um, is likely not required in this case. It's a low-risk therapy, um, and so we, we don't really need to pursue any molecular testing in these patients. Uh, and so extensive education, despite my excitement about this example, uh, is not really required in these patients, unless they're interested, in which case it's a fascinating story to tell your patients. So what about patients where we're considering or recommending genomic evaluation? I think there's, as most of the speakers have talked about, there's a lot of evaluation of mRNA and gene expression changes, but what about when we're actually evaluating the DNA of the patients? I think this holds um, more, it's just more complex for patients to process. 
And so education of patients is important, but first we really need to understand this ourselves. So when considering genetic testing, we really, of course, are mostly motivated by the potential benefits, but we need to think about the potential harms of genetic testing. And this is a little bit of a busy slide, but really the, the genetic test should be motivated um, by the best interests of the patient, the scientific evidence and ethical standards, which we all work by. And again, we're considering the harms. And so before talking about the benefits, I'd really like to highlight the potential harms that we should just sort of be aware of before we recommend this to our patients. Depending on the type of genetic testing, which we'll talk about, this doesn't apply to all genetic testing, but if we're sequencing DNA of patients from a genome wine perspective, there could be potential implications for other family members. We may find things incidentally, and so we may find something that's unrelated to the clinical question that we're actually asking, for example, BRCA mutation. Um, we may find a mutation where actually we know it's not normal, but we don't know how to guide our patient about um, what the implications are for their health. Um, there sometimes are surprises with familial relationships if you're, if you're sequencing most, multiple family members. Um, there may be costs to patients. And this may generate a lot of anxiety, anxiety around having genetic testing done in the first place and anxiety about what one might find. And again, coming back to this idea of variance of uncertain significance, we may find something that looks abnormal, but we may not know what it really means for the patient. Uh, and, and also, we may find something that we know it means for the patient, but we may, we may not have anything we can do about it. Um, there's also employment and insurance discrimination issues, which I won't really talk about today. But really, it's important to understand the test that you're ordering. And so it's, it, it, it's, um, it, it's just really sort of fundamental in this area, and it takes some time to sort of learn these things. It's important to think about pretest probability. Are we looking for something that we're likely to find? Are we sort of looking for a needle in a haystack? These all uh, you know, affect our clinical decision making. Um, we need to know the sensitivity and specificity of the test. We need to, know how to interpret the results. Um, and really going through these motions and these thoughts with your patients is something that takes practice. And so sort of thinking about this ahead of time can really be useful. This is just sort of a quick uh, aside, um, just thinking about what's happening to your patient's data. Is this data, genetic data going to sit in the healthcare system? Is it going to sit in some PI's laboratory? Is it going to be with a private company? Um, thankfully, we have something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which um, protects genetic information from being used by insurers and employers. Uh, but it's important to recognize that there are limitations to this. Um, it doesn't apply to employers with less than 15 employees, and it doesn't apply to other important uh, facets of healthcare, including long-term care and life and disability insurance. And so in the last minute, finally getting to how to educate our patients, um, well, well, really, it, it, it sort of depends what you're recommending to them. And so on the, the screen you see here, patients with severe inflammatory uh, genetic disorders. And for these patients, establishing a genetic diagnosis is really important because we're not only giving them an answer, we also may recommend care based on this decision. This is very difficult to do in dermatology practice, and I totally recognize that. Um, but it's important to recognize that this is really a a finding and a discussion that has profound implications for patients. And so sit down. If you don't have time to sit down, sit down just for a minute. Set up a follow-up time to talk. Call the patients on your way home. Um, explain why you're recommending the testing to the patient. And really, I think ultimately everyone would agree in this room, we're trying to provide the best care for our patients. What do we think about the diagnosis? How is this going to in, in, uh, influence us diagnostically? Do you have a specific diagnosis in mind? What is it? Is there a differential diagnosis that we're trying to you know, uh, parse apart? Is this discovery-based approach? What is the likelihood we'll get an answer? These are the things that the patients are going to be thinking, and I think it's important to be proactive in addressing. And really, ultimately, I think for a lot of patients, it's important to have an answer, but um, from a practical level, Will the findings of the, the evaluation lead to uh, a change in management? And so th when you're recommending to this to patients, it can be something that's sort of um, nebulous. And so it's important to say, are we talking about sampling blood? Are we talking about taking a buccal swab? Are we taking a skin biopsy? Are we doing multiple of these things? Are we looking for specific mutations? Or are we evaluating all the genes in their genome? 
Are we looking for something that they inherited from mom and dad, or are we looking for something that's changed in their body um, through time, probably due to chance or from, from being out in the sun, for example? Um, are we sure that the mutation is the causative, or is this something that's just associated with a relatively increased risk? And again, it's important to remember, remind patients that this may have implications for their family, and uh, turnaround time may be slow. And again, just to iterate, reiterate the standpoint, are we doing you know, mutational testing of someone's melanoma, unlikely to have really big consequences for them, or are we analyzing every gene in their genome? And so just to wrap up, um, it's really just important to go through the possible outcomes of testing. Um, not everywhere, but thankfully many places now have genetic counselors, which are really great. Um, implications uh, include uh, other family members, future family members, um, and you know, the, the, the principles really just um, come back to being a, a good doctor. Use plain, simple language and avoid jargon. Although this may be routine for us, it may be very complex for patients. Um, we want to allow our patients to ask questions. And if you don't have the answer, which is common in a world where we have so many new tests, um, be honest with your patient, but follow up with them. Um, and so, in summary, um, genomics and dermatology can be very powerful. Don't be afraid to pursue these tests. Take time to educate yourself and, and practice. Practice with colleagues beforehand. And then I couldn't help myself uh, but to put in two uh, plugs for how genomics and genetics have really influenced our patient care. And I think these are really exciting areas. And so, for example, in generalized pustular psoriasis, based on basic science research that identified that mutations in an agonist of IL the IL-36 pathway was found in patients with generalized pustular psoriasis led to the concept that maybe if we inhibit this pathway, we can treat patients with this. And very excitingly, uh, specilimumab was just approved uh, for patients with generalized pustular psoriasis, sort of leveraging this basic science finding. And uh, not only does this medicine work, it works really fast. And so that's really cool. And I think probably the most exciting thing for me uh, in the last year was um, this New England Journal of Medicine article um, looking at a herpes virus delivered recombinant collagen 7A1 uh, uh, gene in patients with uh, dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, which if anyone's ever seen this or treated these patients, you know it can just be just a truly devastating disease. Um, and so, of course, we've known the mutation for a long time, but the way that um, uh, technology has progressed, we now have the ability to deliver uh, a functional gene to these patients topically through this uh, BVEC compound. And um, really, although this is not FDA approved, uh, really just tremendously exciting results. And so I hope I leave you with the fact that genomics, genetics, basic scientific investigation just holds incredible power in dermatology. And so with that, I'll wrap up. And um, thanks again, Dr. Bunick. Thank you.